Need for Speed has a big history from its humble beginnings in the 90s all the way to the present day. I've covered each era of its history in separate videos, which were the first big videos that kinda kickstarted my channel. A lot of you probably have seen these videos, but to newcomers on the channel, I wanted to make this series easily accessible by combining all projects into a single video. From the start of the series, the black box era, followed by a couple of goofy PSP ports, and the modern era. The only thing missing in here are the shift games, so my apologies Apologies for those that were interested in them. Think of this as a celebration or anniversary of sorts, the very start of my journey with essay content. Regardless, I hope you enjoy this trip into Need for Speed history. Need for Speed the games during this era is what sets some of us up as racing fans. The nostalgia, the atmosphere, the amazing gameplay and soundtrack were all present in these games. And today we're going to take a little trip into the past and see how it all started for Need for Speed. Starting it off with the very first game, Need for Speed 1. It's the first entry in the series and it did have a few versions that varied from one another. I tried both the 3DO and also the PS1 version, just see how they are. The 3DO version version got released in 1994. It's a very simple arcade game with 3 tracks to play on and 8 cars to choose in total with a lot of historical facts around the cars. If you've never heard of them or seen some of these cars, you can go into the car showcase and it will tell you a little bit about its history for each manufacturer in the game what cars they have produced so far, what engines they use. Basically heaven for car nerds that like to learn something new. The cars you have are the Lamborghini Diablo, Ferrari Testarossa, Dodge Viper, Corvette, Honda NSX, Mazda RX-7, and a Toyota Supra. Alongside the cars, you have the lovely X-Man who you can race against in head-to-head, -head, and he usually has some nice words of encouragement. Oh, what's wrong? Does your widow waste car driver want to go home? Full throttle, red line and muffler burning, turbo charging, paint peeling, blistering son of a gun! Welcome to the Wall of Fame! First to the finish and to the victor the spoils. It's all under the hood, man. And you took it over the line, baby. Way ahead. Way, way, way ahead! To be honest, I love these cutscenes so much. And there's quite a bit of cutscenes that you can get from him. On the road and in your face. What a drive. What a driver. All the scale, all the thrill. Hard driver, man. You blow me away. Yeah, the thrill of this finish line is just the start, man. You are bound for glory with your foot to the floor, baby. Woo! Now, in terms of gameplay, it felt a little bit slow-paced, I would say. Even when you are driving over 100 miles per hour, the game still feels rather slow. I like the little details they had here. Like, if you want to see what's behind you, you have to be in first person and look at the rear view mirror in the cockpit. The way the menus were simply designed and etc. all make for a short but fun experience. Now moving on to the PS1 version of the game, Road and Track presents Need for Speed. This version of the game added more improvements compared to the 3DO version. For one, you had a lot more tracks to play around with, up to 6 in total. The menus look different as well. The car showcase again looked amazing for anyone interested in learning a thing or two about these beauties. And of course, graphically, it looks a bit improved. And it feels a lot faster than the 3DO version. Handling as well was a little different to get used to, with some being a bit too stiff to maneuver. The main objective is to beat the tournament mode to unlock the bonus cars and tracks. But there was one problem. The AI was really damn tough in this game. From the very first race, you couldn't do a single mistake anywhere otherwise you would lose any chance of catching up to the opponents. I kept trying but the best I could achieve in here was a second place once. So I used the cheats to unlock the hidden track, which is called Las Vegas, a high speed circuit with the night lights shining on you as you're driving. A cool feature the game had was if you hold R1 you could try a rally version of a track you raced on. The handling was still the same for the most part, it's mostly in bigger corners you might lose the car, but overall it's a fun mode. By the way, make sure your car fully stops after you finish, the game is scripted to fully close the race once your car stops, so if it doesn't, you might be stuck here for a while. One more thing to mention about these older games is how amazing the soundtracks were in them.
When the first Need for Speed game doing well, the studio decided to make another game, but this time it would be only filled with skylines. Thus we got Need for Speed Skyline Memorial, and one main difference you can tell in this game, except the cars, is the way the difficulty is much much easier in this game. Back in the 90s, the main reason they made these games so difficult in Europe and America was because of game rentals. Game rentals are illegal in Japan, and US companies didn't want people beating the game in a single rental, so they made many of them much harder to encourage purchases. So when playing this, it was much more relaxing. It has the same concept as the first game, which is to beat the tournaments to unlock the bonus stuff, while only using 8 different skylines, and you could win the R390 GT1, which is the only one to have finished in the 1997 Le Mans event, while the others had mechanical issues during it. Same as the first game, you had a showcase for each of these cars, but all were done in Japanese. Handling these cars feels really great, much less stiff than before, and lets you turn more and carry more speeds into corners. As for the rest of the game, it plays out vastly the same as the original, so we can slowly move on to the second game in the series. Next game in the series was Need for Speed 2, and right off the bat you got this amazing song getting you pumped and excited to hop into some events. Need for Speed 2 was released on April 18th, 1997 and it set off to improve the overall package of the first game and make it into something new and fresh. We got some new racetracks added into here from snowy mountain tracks, tropical scenery, cave explorations and a lot more with a new selection of cars at our disposal. More concept cars were introduced in here, more show cases to give information on these unique looking models. The atmosphere in this game is fantastic. There are so many unique and fun looking racetracks in here, the mountains, highway section. You can drive inside of a Hollywood studio set as a bonus track. You can also play around with track settings, choosing if you want it to be mirrored, do you want it rain, and play the way you want to. The main modes you need to complete in this game is the tournament and knockout events to unlock some extra stuff. Nothing too complicating, just pick whatever car you fancy a go at and try and win. One thing that I absolutely love in this game is the cheat codes. This game had such a fun variety of cheats to try and play around with. Like you can drive as a T-Rex, drive as a beer box, a crate, a newsstand, school bus, even a log. The list goes on and on. You can also enable a cheat to turn the races into slot car events. Why don't we have anything like this nowadays? Just simple cheats like these to mess around with. The handling can be a little bit tricky at times. Some cars take a while to turn to where you want them to, and on tracks where there's a lot of turns to be done, it can be a little bit frustrating. The physics are definitely interesting. You mess up at big speeds, you're bound to be flipping around for days till you get reset. Same goes for the AI in some of these tracks. Overall, it's a definitive improvement over the first game. Lots more stuff added to this game, cars to play around with, and cheats to have fun with. Now it's time for the third installment into the series. In 1998, the third Need for Speed was released, going for a different approach to its previous title. Here we were introduced to the cops and hot pursuit modes, where you could play as a cop and bust other racers, or reverse the roles and be the one trying to get away from the cops, giving the full game the name Hot Pursuit 3. The objective is the same as previous games, try and complete the tournament mode and also knockout events. The PS1 version of the game was made by EA Canada, who adopted the handling model from Need for Speed 2 and polished it around to give a nice experience while playing the game. The menus were very simplistic and I like the small details they added, like when you start an event, the needle goes to the top and during the races, you can see the needle on top of the screen. And like the previous games, you had a showcase menu for each manufacturer seeing all of the cars they've made in the past and etc. The game also introduced some beautiful looking tracks like Rocky Pass, Atlantica, Aquatica, like you get to drive under an aquarium. How cool is that? There's also hidden tracks that you can enable with cheat codes like Scorpio 7 which is quite literally underwater. The space race track which is well, in space. <laughs> Autocross, in which you basically are the size of an ant driving around someone's garden, and the caverns, which is full of pillars everywhere, and you need to be precise on your driving to not smash into one of them. You even have a kid's room in here full of toys placed around, and some nice drawings lying around. Overall, I think it was a very fun version of the game, and if you have the PS1 emulator set up, it's a no-brainer to try this game out. Now let's move on to the PC version, which was made by EA Seattle. The PC 
version went for more of a balance between sim and arcade to please the fans. The menus here looked very simple and it would make a reappearance in high stakes PC version. In this version you could also play as a cop. You would be given a cop car and once you start your lights up, your objective would be to pin down the suspect and bust them. And you do that until everyone is busted in the race. The cars weren't too resilient so you could easily spin them out and bust them. It also had some nice little details like for example, if you drive off road these little rocks would slingshot to your windshield and you could see some damage on it and it contains a lot of stuff that the PS1 had like tournaments and knockouts so for the most part it plays the same as the PS1 version. It's a fun experience one you can spend a couple hours playing before wanting to change it up to another game like Need for Speed High Stakes. Need for Speed High Stakes was released in 1999 on PC by EA Seattle and on the PS1 by EA Canada. Right off the bat when you boot up the game you can notice the menus look a bit similar to the previous game but with new stuff on top of it. The introduction of new cars, introduction of a damage system. Each race you could damage your car if you drove it too recklessly and once it's broken you have to spend money to fix it up. Sometimes the damages wouldn't cost a lot but with some cars you better be ready to fork up the cash when necessary because the bills only go higher and higher with each car class you drive. I like the system because it would make you drive a little bit more carefully, having that constant repair bill hanging over your head. You can't mention high stakes without mentioning the amazing soundtrack this game has. incredible stuff back in the day. So the way you would progress in this game is first of all by buying yourself a starter car and afterwards you compete in these tournaments like in the previous game. But there's a lot of them in this game and you don't get cars for free, you need to purchase them in order to even qualify for some of the tournaments. You can also upgrade your cars from level 1 to level 3 and increase the performance drastically in some cars and once you've completed all of them you have successfully finished the game. They also played around with the cob modes from Hopshoot 3 and made them a little better. You could spawn in backup units, roadblocks to help you out. You can even switch between cop cars at any point. So if one is close to the finish or further away, you can switch into his car and continue the chase. Handling in the PC version is very grippy. Most of the time, I didn't even need to let go of the gas. I was able to go full speed pretty much everywhere. You also have the return of the knockout events from the previous games, and you're able to manually set how each race is going to be like. What weather you want, do you want it to be mirrored or not, and etc and you can have some proper fun playing around with these modes. You can even play online in this game, which I made a video about a long time ago if you wish to check it out. As for the PS1 version, it was developed by EA Canada and it has a different look and feel compared to the PC version. The menus, for example, were very similar to PC, just more simplified. But where it really changes that is the handling. Here it feels like they wanted to go for more of a realistic approach, like the car doesn't slide around every corner. You have to judge it a bit more how much you can push it in corners, more simcate-ish handling. Once you get used to it, it is fun to drive around. One big thing that you notice in this version is how aggressive the cops are. In some ways, these cops feel a lot tougher than the cops you see in Most Wanted. They will stay glued to you for a long time, hauling roadblocks to stop you, as well as spiked roadblocks. And once you hit these roadblocks, you lose complete control over the car and get fined instantly. To be honest, even though we're struggling to outrun them, a part of me enjoyed these cop chases. Like nowadays one thing you mostly hear from the newer games is that the cops are super weak and easy to dodge. So to see them tough in these older games is a breath of fresh air sort of. Also a cool little feature is that you can enable the local cops in these events. So if you want to be screamed at by French, German or British cops you can do that. I should also mention the version that I played of this game was also a modded version called Complete Edition. It combines the cars from all regions and adds new content, so that's why you see a GTR in the footage as well. One thing that is different here compared to the PC is that your car automatically gets fixed at the end of every race, and you do get a bonus if you drive perfectly without damaging your car. Visually, it also looks a lot better. The colors are great and it has amazing lighting, giving such a relaxing feeling while driving around these tracks. 
tracks. You got special events in here that require a certain car in order to do them, with varying effects like reverse or mirrored layouts, traffic, nighttime, weather changes, and etc. There was also a cool multiplayer feature this game had. Two players could bet their cars on their memory cards, and the loser would lose their car permanently from the memory card. Overall, it's a really fun experience this game offers. The only negative I sort of had is that it can be a bit grindy unless you're willing to sell some of the cars to compete in other tournaments. I enable a money cheat just so I could do most of them without that worry, but for casual players, I imagine it could be a little bit inconvenient. And that leaves us with the last game from this era, Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed. Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed was released in the year 2000. You could tell because they sold copies where it was called Porsche 2000. There were two studios that handled these games. You had the PC version from EA Canada and the PS1 version from Eden Games, who at the time were known for the V-Rally games and later in life were well known for the Test Drive Unlimited games. How did they handle the PS1 version of this game? So you have both a factory driver mode and evolution mode to play around with. In factory mode, you join Porsche as a test driver and work your way up to the highest role which is ace test driver. Surprisingly here it is very very short. It took less than an hour to fully complete. Most of these challenges involves going around cones as quick as possible, going from point A to point B as fast as possible, and once you are done there you are free to play around in evolution mode. Here you start from the 1950s era and you have to complete tournaments in order to unlock the other eras which is the golden and modern era. A cool detail they had here was trying to match the location and music for the eras. Like in the 1950s, you could notice some classical music and the cities were still just developing. You come to the 1970s, you can notice visually the areas have much more stuff added to them. More lights, buildings, and the music changes afterwards, and same in the modern era. One little negative I had here was that it didn't have a lot of music choices. Like in the classic era, you would hear the same song many times, and in the golden era, the same three songs would always play. Now as for the driving in this game, it is very arcadey. And honestly, it feels like any car you drive is pretty much the same, whether it's an old Porsche or a brand new one. They all just handle the same. Feels like driving an all-wheel drive car, but the car is supposed to be a real-wheel drive. One thing they added here was the ability to drive around in free room and explore the maps. You could also get into chases during it, and if you get busted, you have to pay a fine. In evolution mode, there's like 8 tracks per 3 eras. Overall, I think it's okay-ish, but definitely was a bit annoying with the soundtrack here being on loop for majority of the time. What about the PC version? This is where everything changes. The PC version just knocks it out of the park. The UI and music just flesh out the game in seconds, getting you excited to see what it has to offer. Like the PS1 version, you have both a factory driver mode and evolution mode to play around with. This time, however, the factory mode would take longer to complete, which I didn't mind since you get to experience driving so many different Porsches and driving them here was pretty fun. The handling feels like it's in the middle between sim and arcade handling, kind of similar to PS1 high stakes handling. You have a lot more tests to do as a driver with the same goal of reaching the ace test driver role. Some of these are a bit ridiculous like the ones where you have to do 360s or 180s with your car and as you progress and do more of these tests you are rewarded with Porsches that you can use in evolution mode. Or maybe not as I tried using one but the game just wouldn't let me. The environments look amazing amazing in this game. Driving around the beautiful countryside, busy industrial sections, they put a lot of nice details to flesh out the maps. You even have Monaco in this game to drive around, where most of the circuit events happen. Also, can we have just a moment to reflect on the amazing soundtrack this game has? To be honest, this was my second time playing this game, and first time I struggled in factory mode, but this time around, it was much simpler and more fun for me, and of course seeing all of the beautiful Porsches this game has to offer was amazing. I can see why a lot of fans still love and appreciate the level of detail they put into this game. Graphically, it still looks amazing for a 2000s game, each car having a pretty nice looking interior on top of it. Overall, I think it offers a really fun experience as well nowadays, if you are tired of the newer games. Definitely would recommend coming back to the classics and trying them out.
Starting this nostalgic trip off, we got the game that was the first entry for EA Black Box, Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2. This game, like the previous title Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed, had two versions each for console and PC where two different studios worked on the game. Black Box made the PS2 version and EA Seattle made the versions for more powerful platforms like PC, Xbox, and GameCube. Before this, Black Box did make other games such as NASCAR 2001 and NHL 2K, but this was their first Need for Speed title that they were working on and by October 2nd, 2002, it got released for the PS2 and on October 21st for the PC, Xbox, and GameCube. The game is set across a variety of different themed locations with a lot of sports cars, supercars available through the campaign modes. When you look at the PC and PS2 versions, you can definitely notice big quality changes across both versions, such as the menu designs, events, soundtrack, and etc. The PC version was alright for the most part, but compared to how much Black Box managed to do with the PS2 version, it's safe to say which one people preferred more. You had two championship modes in this game, one where it's just regular cars racing and the second one with cops involved as well. In addition to the street racing challenges, there were some challenges where you played as a cop where you try to chase and bust the racers. The amount of detail they had especially for the PS2 version is insane. The car details look amazing in this game, you could switch your player from male to female and they actually were animated as well. If you look back, they would look back, you can see their hands moving while steering. It's little details but details like that can go a long way as well. The only cons partially I could say this game has is that some of the events can take up to 10 or 15 minutes to complete. And it's even more frustrating because during these events you get chased by the cops which are literally glued to you the second they notice your car. And also the helicopter man. That's have been released already. What the fuck? What type of war crime did we do to get a rocket blasted into our face man? And civilian is dead. What? Bullshit! <laughs> Fucking pure bullshit there, man. <laughs> oh my god. Apart from that, gameplay-wise, this just has much more going for it than the PC version did. And EA saw that the PS2 version of the game was better received than other versions, and hence Black Box was chosen to be the leading studio to develop the future Need for Speed games. It was the start of the early 2000s and during this time franchises such as Fast and Furious were hitting the markets and showcasing a lot of underground style racing, JDM vehicles and plenty of more eye catching things. It was an exciting time for the racing genre which is why a lot of games tried to adapt to the success of Fast and Furious by making games similar to how it was. The success of the film is what motivated the releases of games such as Midnight Club Games, Tree Racing Syndicate and a lot more games and the success of these games resulted and more games being created in the spirit of Fast and Furious. But there was one game that stood out the most. Shortly after the massive success of Hop Shoot 2, EA Black Box were making a new entry into the franchise and a year later we got Need for Speed Underground showcased to us, which was an instant success both critically and financially. The game had features like customization of not only performance parts, but also the visual side like the body parts, liveries and decals, underglow and etc. The city you race on, Olympic City, is the setting of Underground 1, where you're competing for the supremacy of the streets by climbing through the ranks and challenging racers for the number one spot. You are introduced into the scene by Samantha, a fellow racer that gives you the kickstart by letting you buy your first car. Ouch, that is seriously weak, dude. And helping you settle in the underground world. Starting out by doing a few quick races to get your name out there and later finding out who is the king of the streets. Eddie in his Skyline R34 GTR and the leader of the East Siders gang. Along the way you're introduced to other characters such as Jose, Clutch, Dud and TJ who occasionally will give you events that once you complete you can get a unique upgrade for your car. There are 5 game modes in the game which consist of circuits, sprints, drag races, knockout events and drift events. Each of these modes has 10 different racers in the rankings and your goal is to be number 1 in all of them. So that is basically the main plot of the game but how does the gameplay stack up next to it? For starters each event lets you pick from 3 difficulties, easy, medium and hard. The difference is mainly how much the AI will rubber band during the events. It can get a bit tedious at times and for the most part it depends on you if you want to go for higher difficulties. There is a small change in how much money you will get from the events depending on the difficulty. 
Handling also varies from vehicle to vehicle. Some can be easier to maneuver, while others can be a bit more challenging. Mostly it's fairly simple to get used to, although if you are unlucky and hit traffic, the game will do a bit of tomfoolery with the physics. They can definitely be over the top, sometimes making your car flip for ages until it resets you back on the road. A cool new feature they added in was the trade-in option. Through the underground mode, you will unlock new cars as you are winning races, and if you had enough money, you can carry all of your current upgrades and visual customization to another car, which is a positive and a negative in a way, because the game only lets you use one car. You can't have multiple vehicles in your garage. So you have to be a bit picky on what you want to use throughout the game. Over the course of the game, if you break records on the tracks, you will get featured on magazines which you can check out in the main menu. In total, there's 111 events, including the optional ones for unique upgrades which are fairly short and worth doing. The annoying events in the game are mostly the endurance style circuit that you'll be racing on such as events with 6 or 7 laps on them, and knowing how the rubber band is in the game, one wrong move could cost you 5 or 6 minutes of your time on it. Once you've gotten number 1 ranking in all the events, you're able to challenge Eddie for the underground title, which is just a simple sprint around the city, and once you beat him, the real final event will be a circuit event with Eddie's girlfriend, Melissa. Once you defeated her, you have successfully completed the underground mode and are titled the king of the streets. The game took a massive step forwards after Hopsuit 2 with all the new elements it introduced and it was a major success for EA Blackbox, selling well over 15 million copies across all platforms. And with its major success, a prominent sequel was already in the makings for the next year. One thing that the first two games have in common is that they were made on a one year deadline schedule. And over the course of all the games that Black Box has made, this has been a recurring theme amongst the games. It wasn't the only franchise that suffered with such deadlines. Companies like Rockstar did the same with GTA 3 and Vice City, with those two games being only 8 months apart from each other. But nevertheless, Black Box was already working on a new installment into the Need for Speed series, and in November of 2004, Need for Speed Underground 2 got released to the markets. The big change that this game had was that it was the first open world entry into the series. Before that you were only able to drive around during the events, but this time they made it fully open world to explore. After your success in Olympic City, you are called by Caleb, the leader of the race, to join his gang. But after refusing, Caleb attempts to take you out but fails to do so. But he does manage to wreck your car. Six months after that incident, you are on a plane to a new city called Bayview, where Samantha introduces you to her friend Ray Rachel, who is well known around the city. Bayview has five unique districts to it such as City Core, Beacon Hill, Jackson Heights, Coal Harbor and Bayview Speedway, which I will go into depth a bit later on. When you arrive to Bayview, Rachel lends you her 350Z and tells you to meet her at the car lot. You could just meet her there, but the game lets you have some fun in the car by letting you do events before meeting up with Rachel, which is completely optional, but it gives you a mini introduction on how the racing is down in Bayview. You. She even calls you in frustration while waiting for you to give her car back. Hey dude, what's the holdup? You lost or something? The car lot is on the minimap. Hurry up and get over here. I don't have all night. Hey man, I want my car back. You better haul over here ASAP or I'm putting the word out on you. And that means no more racing till I say so. Get over here, now. Once you are done with all the events, you can meet up with her and the game lets you pick from 6 different cars. There is a small difference in the cars you have if you are on NA or EU version. In the NA version you get the Civic and a Miata, but for the EU version you get a 106 Peugeot and a Corsa. Once you select your car, Rachel will tell you to meet her at the garage where she gives you a quick brief down on the racing down here. The game expands on its previous set of events by adding new ones as well. Street X events are a new thing where you race around the drift course maps from Underground 1, the game also introduces SUVs into the game and there's even dedicated events for those vehicles which you can partake in. But the main new event that has been introduced is called the Underground Racing League. To partake in these events, you need to get sponsors throughout the game that will fund you the ticket to participate in the Underground Racing League. 
There's usually three options, each having its own requirements once you sign with them. Usually it's to do specific events that they want and get on the cover of a DVD. The DVD requirements are a new addition into the game. It would rise up depending on the parts you would add to your vehicle and the max rating you could raise it to was 10. Most people didn't like this feature because essentially it would limit the amount of freedom you would have to customizing your car. Most of the time you would throw random stuff on the car you wouldn't normally put on just so you could raise it up to a certain rating so you could take the DVD shot. There are however mods that fully disable this rating which gives you much more freedom to just make the car look how you want versus for a certain rating. The magazines in this game only require you to win a certain amount of events in the current stage to unlock them. They are time limited events that have you driving across the city towards the photo shoot. Once you get there, the game will let you also position the camera to whatever angle you want it for the photo. Another new addition in Free Roam are the Outrun events where you can challenge any racer on the street and if you are 300 meters ahead of them, you win the event. It can be done in less than 10 seconds or if you have my luck sometimes, it can take 2 minutes for them. But if you do a lot of them in a specific stage, you unlock some unique upgrades to your car, such as unique visuals and performance parts. Once all the underground racing events are done, you unlock the next stage and in total there are 5 stages in the game which unlock more parts of Bayview. Each area has a set amount of shops that can be discovered such as body shops, performance shops, graphic shops and car specialist shops. All of them would let you do certain things to the car. Mainly the new addition is the car specialist shop that lets you add further customizations such as hydraulics, underglow, even subwoofers in the trunk which most people in the early 2000s would probably use. <laughs> With all these new things being added to the game we have to take a little step back and mention a few of the flaws that this game suffered from as well. The story in the game takes a repetitive turn. For each stage complete a given amount of events to unlock the underground racing league and progress onwards. There was no fast traveling in this game so for every single event you would have to drive to it to start it and this game had double the amount of events than underground 1 so in short you will have to do quite a lot of driving around the map. For some this isn't a big issue because it is a racing game where you're supposed to drive around but for most people driving from one end of the city to another back and forth 50 times would get tiring pretty quickly. Especially in areas such as Jackson Heights where you would have to drive up and down a lot of the times for either the events or magazines and DVD covers. It was their first open world title so things like this they improved on in later entries but this game really struggled because of the lack of fast traveling. Unfortunately this isn't where the bad parts of the game end. The bad part is mostly the way they designed the underground racing league. These events would take forever to complete and depending on what stage you are in there would be a big amount of these events to do in order to progress the game. There would be events with 3 races, 3 laps each, 2 races with 4 laps and then 1 singular event with 5 laps. These two things were the main reasons most probably never finished Underground 2 with its feeling of repetitiveness later on and also is probably the reason why it sold less copies than its previous title, selling only 7 to 8 million copies. Overall the game can be fun at times but at a certain point you will start to feel the feeling of repeating things over and over to progress onwards. With EA noticing the lower sale numbers, Blackbox had to step it up for the next Need for Speed game and in their luck they managed to make one of the most successful racing games of all time. And for this one I will leave it for Kuru to talk about it. Hey guys, Kuru here. Need for Speed Most Wanted. With EA Black Box having done two games previously without cops, it was time for a bit of a change. In the early beta gameplay, they showcased the pursuit going on the highway, giving us a hint at what the next Need for Speed game could be like. There were a few more demo showcases of a drag event, with you vs Mia in it, and a little bit of gameplay how it was during development. On November 11, 2005, we got the full release of the well-known Need for Speed Most Wanted, and it blew up with it having sold over 16 million copies across all platforms. You are a racer around Rockport City looking to make a name for yourself, to challenge one of the blacklist members called Razor. Although in the beta footage for this game there were 16 members and Rock was the 16th, but that idea got scrapped. Razor was the number 15 guy. Winning a few events gets you the opportunity to challenge him, but along the way Razor sabotages your ride and you get arrested after losing your car. Now out of jail, you have a clear goal in mind, beat Razor and get your car back. But while you were in jail, Razor used the car to climb to the number one spot on the blacklist. 
The map is split into three districts, Rosewood, Camden Beach and Rockport. And you will be racing all over these districts to make your way all the way to the top to the blacklist. A thing they added in this game was the ability to select events from the menu screen, which saves you quite a lot of time in terms of driving to each event, unlike in Underground 2, where you would need to go up and down the city to do any events. There are 15 blacklist members with their own challenges that you need to complete in order to get a shot at challenging them. A new element this game introduced was the bounty system and milestones. There are requirements to challenge a boss or in this case a blacklist racer, unlike the previous installments where you could challenge the boss by just winning the previous races. These requirements range from earning a certain amount of bounty in pursuits or causing enough damage to the state or crashing into or disabling police units alongside winning races. That involves you doing quite a bit of chases, but the cops in this game are rather simplistic. If you compare them to the ones in Hot Pursuit 2, these ones only get tougher when you're in condition 4 or 5, and even then it's not that difficult, for the most part. Once you meet all the requirements, you can challenge the backlist member. It can range from 2 events to 3, all the way to 5 when you get to Razor. When you beat a Blacklist member, the game lets you pick 2 from 6 markers as a reward. 3 random ones, which could give you a car, a get out of jail free card, a bounty marker or some cash. On the other side you have visual markers, which let you buy a unique vinyl for free. Aftermarket parts will give you access to any body kit, hood or roof scoop that you want. And of course the Junkman performance markers, which will make your car even faster. The gameplay compared to Underground 2 did receive some changes as well. The handling feels a lot grippier than it is in the previous game, making all cars handle exactly the same, whether it be all-wheel, front-wheel or rear-wheel drive. Most of the tuning options from Underground 2 have been removed or changed up. Like the front rear and the side options became just a full body kit option and most wanted. Underglow and hydraulic systems were also removed. Same goes for the trunk, but some of these were minor things that most people probably overlooked. Once you climbed your way all the way through the blacklist, your final opponent, aka Clarence Callahan, stands before you, ready for a challenge. You challenge him and get your ride back. When you finally beat Razor, we get to know that Mia has been working with the police all along. This was hinted during a cutscene where she has crossed his PDA and hands it to you. She lets the player go when the police arrive because he helped her get every Blacklist member behind bars. Sadly, Cross wasn't too happy to hear the news and unleashes the whole Rockford Police Department onto the player. During this chase, you have to survive for 5 minutes during condition 6, before Mia calls you to tell you that Cross knows about the safe houses and the only way to escape is to jump over the old bridge near the stadium. With the player successfully escaping the police, that concludes the story of Need for Speed Most Wanted. The challenge series adds additional content upon completion of the game, providing players with additional replay value. There were two extra events as well that you could unlock if you had the Black Edition of the game. In Challenge 69, you try to get 500,000 bounty in a Camaro SS. And in order to unlock Challenge number 70, you have to type Burger King at the startup screen. Afterwards, you will be able to access a sprint race in the M3, which after completion unlocks all the Junkman parts, which you can use in My Cars option for any car that you want. The game has 32 cars in total. You can take them and customize them to your liking, which is a slight improvement from the 25 cars of Underground 2. Some cars were cut due to licensing issues, Nissan for example, and some cars that weren't in Need for Speed before made an entrance for the first time into the franchise. To this day, Need for Speed Most Wanted is the definitive version of Need for Speed for most people. Either they want the new game to be like this or a remake of the old one. The game is praised and loved by so many people out there even after 16 years after its release. That is all I have to mention about Need for Speed Most Wanted. My question to you is, do you think there ever will be a Need for Speed as successful as this game? Leave your opinions in the comments below. Crew out. With EA's strict deadline of one new game each year, Black Box had to work quick on the next entry in the franchise. And in 2006, we have gotten early snippets of the game called Need for Speed Carbon. But it didn't meet sales expectations, having only sold 3.2 million copies compared to most wanted 16 million. Let's see why that was the case. It was going to be a sequel from Most Wanted. After the player jumps the old bridge, he heads over to a city where it all started for him. Palman City. 
In these flashback scenes, you can see the protagonist being given keys to a Supra to use in a street race against three other people. The race goes well until someone tips off the cops and everyone apart from you gets arrested. Panicking and not sure what to do, Nikki gives you the cash and you drive off. But shortly afterwards you find out the bag is fake and Darius tells you to grab his car and get out of here. After the events of Most Wanted, the player is slowly making his way home, but he's reintroduced to his old enemy. Hey, guess who's back? While trying to get away from Cross, the player totals their car and is busted. Cross comes over to finish the job, but Darius and his crew show up to intervene. Here you're introduced to Darius and Nikki, although Nikki is not happy to see you right now. And Darius offers to pay your bounty off in exchange if you help him conquer all the territories in Palman City. To do this, you will need a car and Nikki knows the right person that can offer you a nice ride. That's great. I'm the monkey! The game gives you three options to pick from, a muscle car, a tuner, and an exotic. Unlike the previous game, this choice will also affect your campaign. It will alter your wingman's car and the starting territory. When you choose your ride, you are put into San Juan to test out your car and the wingman abilities, which are also new to this game. We have blockers, scouts, and drafters, which do their own certain things. Blockers help you by hitting a targeted driver. Scouts help you find shortcuts and drafters help you gain speed throughout an event. Neville joins you as the very first wingman after you're introduced to him. Later on, you're introduced to Sal, who is played by Adam Jensen. The city has changed a lot and you don't know many people in it, so as your first wingman, Neville joins your crew which you can name and give a custom emblem to. The city is divided into many districts and in order to take over them, you need to win two out of three races in the territory, and once you take over all of the territories, in a certain part of the city, you will get a chance to challenge the boss of that area. There are four major crews ruling this city in their respective districts, namely Wolf's TFK, Angie's 21st Street, Kenji's Bushido, and Darius' stacked deck. It sounds pretty interesting so far, you're probably excited and ready to hit the streets, but there's only one problem, sort of. The game is relatively short. EA made two separate teams for their two next Need for Speed projects, one for Carbon and other one for Pro Street. And as it was a annual franchise, Carbon got the shorter stick and ended up with a shorter campaign and feels more incomplete than most wanted even though it had many improvements over the previous game. It could be completed in a day or two because of it, and people that probably spent quite a bit of money expecting a decent length game were really disappointed afterwards. Even the challenge series introduced in here also could be fully done in a couple of hours. The game had a really interesting idea like introducing canyon events, canyon duels, the wingman system, but because of the short time, most of these ideas were kind of quickly done, and you can notice in game as well how little you can actually do some of these events, which is a shame because this game if it had maybe another year could have been much better than it ended up being. But nevertheless let's talk about the gameplay a bit. Most of the gameplay elements from Most Wanted have been carried over to this game and were improved upon. However police chases are not an important part of progression anymore. The wingman mechanics is supposed to emphasize teamwork so in cases if they win the event you both have won it together. But this wingman system is a bit broken as they can be way ahead of the competition most of the time making it super simple to take over the territories. Depending on the person, this can be either really good or a bit boring in terms of gameplay. The performance customization is back for most wanted and is improved heavily upon as it allows the player to either make a drift build or a grip build which became a staple in later games. The visual customization was also improved upon by the introduction of auto sculpt which allows the player to fine tune the body kits they put on. In free roam you can get challenged against rival crews which you can either accept or decline but if you accept you can select any of the green markers on the map as the finish lines and whoever reaches it first gets $1000 for winning. Drag races were removed but replaced with drift events in closed areas and actual canyon ones which gives off a bit of an initial D vibe to it and toolbuff events from most one are just normal checkpoint events in Cobham. Once you have taken over all of the areas in a certain district, you are able to challenge the boss of that district. However, it's only a circuit event followed up by a canyon duel. After you win both events, you get to choose two markers like you could in Most Wanted. However, there are no junkman parts in this game, so you can get an extra cross marker instead. 
When you're back in free roam, you will get a call from one of the members of the crew you just defeated, wanting to join your crew now, and they give you a bit of a trip down memory lane, as all of them were present during the event where you had to leave town and tell what they saw from their own perspectives, and giving you more information about that tragic night. With all their knowledge learned, you now understand what happened back then, and after defeating the third boss, Darius calls you to celebrate this moment, but it's then he backstabs you and hands you back to Cross. Him and Nikki having worked out a deal, let the player go in exchange for letting Nikki race in your crew. After learning of Nikki's betrayal, Darius tries to defend his territory by having all the crew leaders race against the player. This however doesn't go well and Darius and the player battle it out in a canyon duel which the player ultimately succeeds in. Ultimately, the length and the content of Need for Speed Carbon is a sacrifice to what would come next in the Need for Speed franchise. And for this segment of the video, I'll have my good friend Eden mention a few words about the next Need for Speed game. With Need for Speed Carbon underperforming in terms of sales, Blackbox decided to go with a fresh idea for the next entry into the franchise. In 2007, we were introduced to Need for Speed Pro Street, a game which heavily focuses on legal racing. And with it, a lot of things from the older games disappeared, such as an open world and cop chases. You are playing as Ryan Cooper, who has entered a qualifier in Chicago to enter one of the most renowned race organizations called Battle Machine. And your goal in Pro Street is to beat all the kings, each of whom being a master of their class. The kings are split into five groups, those being Grip, Speed, Drift, Drag, and finally the main showdown king, Ryu Watanabe. To do this you will need many cars, and Pro Street has increased its car count significantly compared to its predecessors, with the base game having 62 cars and additional 14 cars you can get through the Collector's Edition. Pro Street felt like a change of pace, as it did not have an open world, and so it took a different approach by adding dedicated tracks from around the world. In order to progress you had to win race days, which are a collection of race events, in order to unlock the showdowns which give you access to more race days on the career map. After winning your third showdown, you get a shot at challenging the showdown king Rio. Occasionally you can run into challenge race days, where you could win an extra car if you dominated the race day, which was a nice bonus. However, to unlock the race days for the other kings, you would need to set 10 track records in a specific event type for the according king you want to go for. Track records are set through beating the high score of an event, which is accumulated through things such as the lap time or the amount of damage taken. The other kings consisted of Aki Kimura as the Drift King, Kelly Monroe as the Drag King, or Queen rather, Ray Krieger as the Grip King, and Nate Denver as the Speed King. I'll get back to them in just a minute. As we mentioned before, they added a lot more cars into the game, and with that came more in-depth customization to the vehicles as well. Autosculpt returned from carbon and is a bit more refined and usable in this game. Additionally, you had an extra menu for fine-tuning your vehicle. From tuning gear ratios, the suspension, the engines and other components, you could control exactly how your car is set up. We've seen this feature in Underground 2 as well and it made a lot of sense to bring back for Pro Street. The livery editor was pretty decent for its time. They made it a lot easier to apply decals and vinyls onto your cars and move them around. Unfortunately, there was a limit of 20 for vinyls and decals each. But even with its limitations, the livery editor was pretty decent for its time. And of course, we can't ignore the amazing soundtrack Pro Street brought to the table. Artists such as Junkie XL and Avenged Sevenfold made a return, but newer names such as Digitalism appeared on the soundtrack as well. Its amazing mix of dirty EDM and punchy rock made this one of my absolute favorite soundtracks of any game ever. Let's talk a little bit about the scenery in this game. It varies from location to location, where the American tracks like Nevada Highway and Willow Springs have somewhat of a warmer atmosphere, whereas the European tracks have a colder one to signify that they are in a colder region. And Tokyo is a concrete jungle with the street aesthetic being much amplified. Most of the event types were also in the previous entries, such as drag racing and drifting, but there's also a new one. Drag races were split into quarter mile events, half mile events and wheelie competitions. In other entries you would usually just do one attempt and you're done, but here you need to complete multiple rounds and try to go for a faster time. Or you can just use speedrun tactics by getting exactly one time in and then getting yourself disqualified by jumping the start. Drifting received a lot of criticism in Carbon and you can definitely feel a much different handling model for the drift events in this one. It's a bit more complex than it was in Carbon, which is nice considering how easy it was in that game. Just watch out for that one drift track in Tokyo Dockyards. That one is simply painful. Grip class is pretty much the normal circuit experience mixed with a few extra events such as sector shootouts and time attack. Nothing all too special and plays pretty much just like you'd expect. The more in-depth handling model does make these pretty fun. 
New to the series were speed events, which in essence are similar to sprint and speed trap events from Most Wanted, but on their own unique tracks prioritizing neck breaking speeds. All of these events were evenly spread out across the race day, so you had a decent choice of events to pick from each time. The game also had DLC events using a new location in Leipzig, Germany, as well as a new speed track in Tokyo Expressway. There also were the dockyards, although you do need the 1.1 version of the game to unlock them. Now, let's come back to the kings I've mentioned earlier. As mentioned before, you have 5 kings to beat in Pro Street, but the vehicles developers chose for some of the kings were a bit disappointing. Let's have a look at Ray Krieger, the Grip King as an example. He drives a BMW M3 E92, but then one of his crew members is driving a Porsche 911, which is clearly much better than his car, yet he somehow manages to be the king. It's painfully obvious when you actually enter the duel against him that he is incredibly slow and can be beaten with ease. The same can be said for the Speed King, with him driving a 65 Pontiac GTO and one of his crew members driving a literal Pagani Zonda. The cars, although looking admittedly cool, are just not really fit for the roles their kings need to fill. The other kings didn't have this issue thankfully, but it still was a bit of a missed opportunity to make the events more memorable. Instead, they end on a wet fart unfortunately. Once you have finished all the showdown events, you are able to challenge Ryo for his crown in a set of 10 events. Most of them are fairly simple, except for that infamous Tokyo Drift event that still haunts most players who have gotten this far. Beat all the races and you have completed the main story. Clean up all of the other kings and you are crowned as the Street King. However, no review of Pro Street would be complete without mentioning its infamous amount of jank. As much as this game is beloved by the community, it came with certain issues, particularly on modern operating systems. Front and center of those is the continue bug, mostly present on Windows 10 systems, which is thankfully fixable with Xanvia's fix. The far cam during speed events had a nauseating amount of camera shake, which made it pretty hard to see where you were going. If you are using the casual setting for your assists and enter a drift event, you can get a lot more points, which is used in speedrunning as well. Sticking to drift events for a moment, there's a particular quirk with its handling system where you could hold the handbrake to artificially extend your drifts as the cars lose a lot less forward momentum than they should. Tunes for drag vehicles tended to be broken, making it possible to complete a quarter mile in just 5 seconds using vehicles like the Camaro or the Supra. The DLC for the PC version was rushed. Car model errors ranging from misplaced exhausts to hold body kits and engine sounds missing are a common occurrence. Not to mention the DLC cars are available for free to the player, meaning you could pick some of the fastest cars like the F1 or the CCX right at the beginning of the game. Those were the ones that I remember from the top of my head, but if you have any other bugs that I didn't mention in here, let us know in the comments down below. With Pro Street's new direction, as controversial as it may have been at the time, Blackbox was able to sell around 5 million units, which was an improvement over its previous title, having sold only 3.2 million. But still, it was a far reach from the numbers Most Wanted has made. Ultimately, it was a good comeback from Need for Speed Carbon, and the effort they put into this title was noticed. But it also got criticism for straying too far off the formula Most Wanted has established. So that's where they wanted to return to with the next game. Need for Speed Undercover was the next release in the Need for Speed franchise, and oh boy, did it have its flaws. It was supposedly the longest developed Need for Speed game, being made after Most Wanted, but then again in that time, it was mostly storyboard and sketching, but after Pro Street, they only had 6 months to develop the game. Not being able to properly introduce the right physics and graphics led to the game underperforming massively. Let's talk about what Undercover contains. As the name suggests, Need for Speed Undercover puts you in the shoes of an undercover cop who infiltrates a street racing scene in an area called Tri-City Bay, whose job is to win races to gain respect as a wheelman and get the main members taken out or arrested and you do that by winning a lot of races around the city. You also have the cop events which in this game are way too simplified. A modder for this game mentioned to me that this game used the police database from Need for Speed Most Wanted, so that's why some of these events ended up being the way they are. It also ended up using the format from the Carbon Challenge series. You were able to only go for one milestone instead of multiple like you could in Most Wanted. Some of them would require you to take out like three cops and escape, some to get a bit of cost to state, and also events where you just quickly need to lose them. The main events consisted of circuits, sprints, and checkpoint events. Drag and drift events got completely scrapped from this game, sadly. 
Honestly, I could sit here and talk about the game's story as I did for the other games, but it's Need for Speed Undercover and most of you probably want to know why did it perform so badly. Let me show you a few examples of the game from my Twitch stream, which by the way you can check out in the description below. Now who's gonna be the person- What the f- <laughs> He's ahead of me as well! What? <laughs> That is the best shortcut I've seen the AI take in my life. Are you fucking kidding me? No! No way! Can I get back? Oh, I can get back. Thought I locked myself out for a moment. Ouch. <laughs> Huh? Uh, uh, I think I did something wrong here. Um, yeah, um, oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? I don't think it's supposed to be like that. How did I manage this? This thing is like unflippable, even from what I know, or pushable. I'm pretty sure I've said this for so many games today, but rushing out any product will always end up making it terrible in the end, or in some cases even unplayable. I don't know why most of these games back in the day had these awful piss filters over the screen as well. Like 9 out of 10 times, it just looks so much worse with it. The skybox is basically a PNG that rotates depending on your car's movement, and also the terrible blur effects as well while driving. The funniest thing is that you can actually use the nitro in this game to have much more grip around the corners, so you could literally take any corner at like 200 or 300 kilometers per hour and not crash your car. I should also mention this, they had a mini series to showcase some of the events that happened throughout the story, but it ended up mostly just being a promotion work for the Nissan 370Z. You can actually check out these episodes on YouTube, I'll have a link in the description. Need for Speed Undercover tried to be a bit darker and more mature than its previous entries, but it ended up coming off as cheesy and the amount of bugs, glitches all around made it not as enjoyable as most probably wanted it to be. So the game resulted in the poor reception and it was one of the lowest selling titles in the Need for Speed franchise. After the disappointment from Need for Speed Undercover, the studio got relegated to a much different role and ended up helping around the launch of their online game Need for Speed World. It got released on July 27, 2010 and if you purchased the starter pack you could play it a week earlier. The maps were from Need for Speed Most Wanted and Carbon put together to make a huge world for people to play together. There were also speculations of Need for Speed Undercover's map being put together here as well but that never ended up happening. The driving and majority of the gameplay was similar to Most Wanted in Carbon with the handling lifted straight up from Carbon and police was like how it was in Most Wanted if not harder. The game also introduces the power-up system letting you choose 4 abilities to use during races or cop chases. It ranged from abilities like Nitro, Slingshot, to crazier ones like Traffic Magnet, Emergency Evade and many more. During the time it was alive, it had a wide variety of events that you could play around with your friends. Normal events, team escapes or even just going to a nice place to take some photos together. The game was decent from an online aspect, getting regular updates but over time microtransactions made its way into the game. Having vehicles such as the F1 Elite costing 100 euros to obtain and many other vehicles for different prices. So it meant if you wanted to drive some other cars that weren't free, you would need to invest your real life money into this game. Need for Speed World was part of many other online games EA made during the time. Games like FIFA World, Battlefield, Play for Free, Heroes, but ultimately all of these online games had their servers fully shut down on 14th of July 2015. However, in 2019 it was resurrected with the help of the community and nowadays you can play it on servers such as World United and Night Riders and other private servers that exist for it. The best part about these servers is that all the vehicles are now purchasable with the in-game cash instead of IRL money, giving you the freedom to try whatever car you fancy a go at. And even they get lots of new content added to them, new races, power-ups and vehicles especially. If you guys want to still play this, I will leave a link in the description where you can download it for yourself. The last main Need for Speed entry from Black Box Studios was Need for Speed The Run. It took a different approach as well compared to Undercover and instead focused more on the cinematic approach with its storytelling and gameplay. You play as Jack who has gotten himself in a bit of a hefty situation with the Mafia 
He's been gambling a lot of the money he borrowed from them and the mafia won his head because of it. Your friend Sam shows you an event that you can participate in which has you driving from San Francisco all the way to New York for the grand prize of 25 million dollars. Jack without many options left to pay off the mob sets out on his 3000 mile journey to win the race. This game was also made during the time EA forced all the studios to use the new Frostbite engine which mainly was designed for Battlefield games. It looked amazing, but a lot of the studios that were forced to use it were struggling to make proper gameplay out of it, especially with games that weren't intended for the engines, so in some cases there were bugs and glitches because of it. It's a decent game all around. The gameplay was pretty alright. Handling was really nice, making it easier to control all of the vehicles. It introduced a new thing with quick time events that you do a few times throughout the story. Just be sure to hit the button props on time. The scenery was beautiful in this game, you get to drive across different terrains like the desert, the mountains, countryside, and I gotta say my favorite probably is the mountain section of this game. I mean just look at this event. The game had a max of 30 levels and each level you would get a new reward such as nitro, the drafting system, cars and many other things. You could also increase this level with online events but all the servers were sadly shut down in August of 2021. The run didn't have an open world like Need for Speed Pro Street so for the most part it's a linear story that you just play from start to finish. It is an alright story but nothing too interesting that makes you want to replay it multiple times. There is an extra thing you could do which is the challenge shares but here's just doing time attacks and normal sprint events compared to the older challenge series. It was also during this time that EA gave Criterion Games a chance to make a Need for Speed game as well. Before this they were responsible for games such as the Burnout series and Black for the PS2. So they went ahead and made Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2010 which sold a lot more copies than Need for Speed The Run did and in 2012 Black Box Games got replaced with Criterion Games who took the reins for the series moving forwards. Black Box was still around but they got renamed to Quickline Games which sadly got fully shut down in 2013. I've mentioned a lot that some of these games were either too short, had repetitive gameplay and other things, but I wanted to mention mods that exist in the community which fixes some of the issues that these games have suffered from as a little tribute to the Need for Speed modding community. Pepega mod. This mod was made by Eden and his team, it completely overhauls the game by adding in much more content to the game, a lot more memes as well but overall a fantastic experience that I recommend you should try. Also me and my community have a challenge in that mod, spoilers. <laughs> They're also making Pro Street Pepega mod which hopefully will be out by the end of this year. Hot Pursuit Challenges if you are a fan of Hop Shoot 3, then this mod is for you. It converts this game into Hop Shoot 3, but in Rockport's world, making the scenery much more tropical, vibrant sky, more vegetation, adding in vehicles such as the Ferraris, Corvettes, and many more from Hop Shoot 3. Definitely worth checking out this amazing mod. Carbon Battle Royale mod. We have criticized the short length that Need for Speed Carbon is, but the Carbon Battle Royale mod aims to change that. It doubles down on the events, adding much more races to do in story mode, more districts to take over, expands upon the challenge series as well. And most importantly, it gives you an option to have tougher opponents when installing this mod. So if you got bored of easily winning all the drift events, now you got a proper challenge as the AI will get higher scores while drifting. Cars are split into race and drift categories. Before this you could use any car to drift because of the broken physics, but now it's a bit more refined so you actually need a proper drift car for them. It adds more cars to the roster giving you even more variety in vehicles. It is a little bit unstable at times so do expect to encounter some crashes while playing it, but other than that it's a mod that I come back to every once in a while when replaying Need for Speed Carbon. Project Reformed Despite all the problems previously documented on Need for Speed Undercover before, there exists this mod that aims to fix this game's most glaring issues with the name of Project Reform by Lake Solo and his huge team. Aiming to restore and properly adjust the handling of the vehicles, the graphics, cops, skies, AI, textures and more to come in the future. Immediately noticing the vast upgrade from the vanilla experience.
For the longest time during the 90s and 2000s, Need for Speed has been a subject of peculiar ports. Even as early as the very first game which was released for the 3DO, PS1 and PC. With each version having slight differences such as the gameplay, graphics, story even in some cases. And this culture of different ports, content and developers would continue on until they stopped with Most Wanted 2012. The most notable of these examples are with Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed for PC and PS1, having completely different handling and styles of content. Then after that we got Hot Pursuit 2 which started off the black box era as they were originally only tasked to port Hot Pursuit 2. But then of course things get a little bit funky when EA decided every single title from the black box era should have a port in every possible machine. Hence why we got blessed with Underground and Most Wanted Java, Carbon PSP, Undercover PS2 and the many 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 bizarre ports. But if I had to pick the one favorite port that is so wacky and how over the top it is, then by all means I would have to pick this one. This right here is not your ordinary Need for Speed game. The title received ports for multiple consoles. The main game however, which was developed by Black Box Studios, was made for the Xbox 360 and PS3. However, just like the games of the past, there are other ports made by a different studio. In the case of the run, these ports would be handled by Firebrand Studios. The same studio that was responsible for this game, if you can even call it like that. But this isn't Firebrand's first rodeo with the Need for Speed franchise. In the past, they were responsible for the DS port of Undercover and Nitro. So it's not exactly a surprise the Wii and 3DS ports would be handed to them. And boy did they do a heroic job on this one. At its core, the run didn't stray too far from the original version of the game, utilizing the same story of a cross-country race with a high money count as a reward, with hundreds of participants. The major difference, however, is in the details. A lot Lot of details. So to start it off, let's try and experience the story from the very beginning. The first noticeable thing is the presentation. It's in the style of a comic book instead of your usual CGI animation, similar to how Max Payne did it back in the day. While this can be a unique thing, in the case of this game, the art style feels incomplete or rushed. Just look at the faces, man. And the very goofy uh, plot points. Early on in the game, you are chased by an assassin that wants to kill you. He gets to your car and throws you out, ruffles you around a bit and just says, okay, let's race. Like, what? <laughs> and the goofy moments in this game don't stop, to the point where we just outright get attacked by a bunch of Mafia members that have a pizza logo on their car, commit heroic murders with a golf club, the goofiness does not stop with this game. And all of this is sprinkled throughout with the storyline. It just doesn't make any sense, but it's so over the top you can't stop looking at it. Like watching a modern Fast and Furious movie. But what is the story anyways? The story begins with our main protagonist, Matt waking up after his car has been dumped in the river. Then suddenly, a redhead appears out of nowhere and offers him to use her car and drive them both to win the run. So your first task is to drive to the start of the race while also doing as many flips as you can, because why not? There's certainly some differences to the original game, but the important bits are still the same, except the part where the race takes place after a police roadblock and for some reason, six racers are just standing by waiting for the queue to go. Even though there are 140 44 other racers that already started in front of them. The logistics here are basically non-existent. <laughs> but surely now that we are in the race, everything goes back to normal for a bit. All that is until we start noticing some oddities. First off, the bottom right corner. You got the car, health, nitro, and how many lives you have. So for the most part, gameplay-wise, it's not that different from the original, except the rubber band. This game has a ludicrous rubber band system. Until you're close to the finish line, just like your usual low-budget racing games. Some of the later notable story moments are like when we had to commit a heroic murder on a guy in a Mustang, then somehow decide to switch cars despite the car being wrecked, followed by a super epic heroic jump over a broken bridge. Later on you somehow pissed off a pizza parlor mafia which decided to bring a fucking rocket launcher into the mix and you have to avoid them as part of this minigame and a bunch of other wacky minigames. Why do they exist? Because reasons that I do not know of. <laughs> 
But anyways, after dodging rockets, your driver heroically jumps onto a moving train and conveniently enough, there's an empty Aston Martin 177 in it. Very, very convenient. <laughs> Every time the main character loses a car, they somehow always manage to miraculously get a brand new and much faster car, which on one hand is a way to get this feeling of progression with the story and also for vehicle variety because unlike the original game, you can't really choose what car to drive here. So instead they decide to write in some of the most flimmiest explanations as to why we kept switching cars. And somehow later on, the assassin is a buddy of yours now. If you're confused with all the different stuff that happens in the story, don't worry, that was the same case for me. <laughs> oh yeah, the redhead is also scheming and now we're driving with this dude. Before getting the surprise of being part of the FBI's top most wanted list. I guess heroic murders aren't exactly immune from the law. So there's only one way out of this. Violence and lots of it. <laughs> but of course it's time to return to a generic story where the protagonist gets his girl. We are rescuing the redhead from the mafia again and so we embark on a final run in the Pagani. Escaping and dodging both the pizza mafia and police force to win the run. Except here comes another change from the original. In the original run the whole event is orchestrated by a mysterious figure with a prize pool of 25 million dollars. Which explains why everyone brought out cars from all ranges including hypercars. In this version, the reward is only a million dollars, which means a lot of the hypercars used here are more expensive than the reward money and the whole event is orchestrated by the cops. Yeah, you heard that right. The cops created the run for the purpose of uh, catching street racers, I guess? Look, I don't know what's going on at this point. This game is just batshit insane with the story development. It moves so fast and nothing makes sense. So just like in Most Wanted, we're going for a final pursuit before setting off into the sunset with a very heroic reveal of Redhead being an important person to the pizza mafia. Thus ends the story of Mad and Redhead before they set off into the heroic sunset with a heroic romance followed by a heroic marriage and then a heroic divorce. <laughs> While that is the end of the main story, this game does have some other things to offer, like the challenges and we can also take a look at bunch of cars in the garage option. There's also multiplayer, but did anyone actually play the multiplayer in this game? But yeah, that's pretty much all Need for Speed The Run has to offer on the Wii. Now originally, the plan was just to play this one title and make a video out of it, but during the stream, many people seemed to be very eager to see a coverage of the other Wii games like Hot Pursuit and Nitro, so guess what I did? So we are continuing with this goofy odd trip with the next game being Need for Speed Hop Suit 2010 Wii Edition. God, that's a long name. This game is developed by Exion Entertainment. This isn't exactly the first time I've encountered them because before this they were responsible for a number of Need for Speed ports such as the NDS ports of Carbon and Pro Street. But my personal experience with them is specifically with the PS2 port of Undercover. So with that background, I didn't have the biggest of expectations with this game. But let's Let's see what they have created. The menu definitely looks interesting. There's only a quick race and career here. As if we needed more confirmation of just how different this game is from the original version, the map takes place in a ton of places around the world, just like the old Hob Pursuit and something like a burnout game. Each city contains a bunch of races, but the ultimate goal is the Grand Prix tournaments, with game modes from the main Hob Pursuit race with cops, Eliminator, which you already know of, Time Marker, yet another attempt at a fancy name for Time Attack, and Rush Hour, which is basically Battle Royale before it became popular in modern times. They even managed to fit 99 opponents into this game mode without having the console explode. I'm actually amazed how they achieved that, but either way, you've seen enough gameplay to know it has pretty weird controls. They get even weirder with some of the item effects you can pick up from... Wait, items? So these items are called soups or whatever. They're power-ups that grant certain abilities like dropping a massive fart sound effect on your opponents, yoinking their nitro, losing the cops, and a few more with my favorite being the cruise control. This one is straight up a cheat code. But the most important one generally is the repair power-up because you can get damaged either visually, tire popping, or even getting wrecked and busted. The driving physics are not the only thing that are a little bit finicky with this game. The menu is pretty much just as finicky to navigate. Like the hard 
hardest challenge in this game is to buy and customize cars because you have to point and click with the cursor everywhere. Turns out you can in fact rise up the cars in this one with some pretty interesting options too. Aside from how every car only has one body kit option. But hey, at least you can change a lot of rims and add some funky vinyls using bounties, which is apparently the currency in this game. Though what about the cars themselves? Since the game separates races with different classes, you are encouraged to use different cars for different classes with D-Class on the lowest and S as the highest. It's certainly a lot more encouraged with every race possible unlocking new cars especially when dealing with the bosses. Each big city has its own boss which you can only challenge once you complete all the events beforehand and when you finally challenge them, it's just a checkpoint race with the whole map being open unlike most of the other races and just having to collect two markers to win. Speaking about the cities, let's check what areas this game has to offer. Starting from... Uh... China, the city of Instagram influencers Dubai, Brazil, and Las Vegas, Nevada, the only American map in this game. Surprisingly, all these maps are pretty unique with very colorful aesthetics, but with the amount of repeats you'll do, it's not surprising anyone would get sick or bored of them pretty quick. And yeah, I think that's all I can say about this game. It's fun for a bit, but it does get way too repetitive after a short while. The game certainly has some standout moments like the Battle Royale mode and some of the wacky item effects. But it's really just an okay game. If you have a Wii and are looking for a game to enjoy for a bit, not much else to say about it. Now for the next one, it's a very specific Need for Speed game with an infamous reputation for a simple reason, its choice of art style. But of course I'm gonna try and see if the game in its entirety deserves all the hate. Need for Speed Nitro is developed by EA Montreal for the Wii. Compared to the previous two, this game is the earliest being developed in 2009, with emphasis on speed and excitement over realism or vehicle tuning. As if the goofy looking cars aren't enough indication with how much realism has been thrown out the window. For the first time the UI doesn't feel like it was half-assed or just stamped on in a hurry, which honestly already gives me quite an appreciation to the game. So when it comes to the handling, this honestly feels like Criterion's formula from the arcadey handling to the very effective break to drift, which for once actually fits with the aesthetics of the game to be honest. And with the existence of a drift challenge within the career, you'll be doing a lot of breaking and drifting. For the career of this game, it's actually quite similar to Hot Pursuit Wii career progression. You basically do a set of events over several countries starting from Rio de Janeiro, easily making this game better than Hot Pursuit already by starting in Brazil instead of China. Mister, it was a joke. Can you please let me out? I haven't seen my family in weeks. Other areas being Cairo, Madrid, Singapore, and finally Dubai. They really don't waste any opportunities with these different cities as each got some super unique vibe and even got some interesting racetracks. The races in each area are usually split into different types, most being the usual circuits, eliminations, drift challenges, and drag racing. So I guess this game is quite similar to something like Underground when it comes to the available race types, while well, aside from the speed traps and time attacks. Each area has one rival to watch out for as well, because they will watch you a lot during the loading screen. They got some swag cutscenes, especially this guy from Dubai that just decides to throw money at you. Throughout the races, there's a mechanic called Own It. A unique mechanic to Nitro where being in the lead will paint the surrounding area with your graffiti tag. It's cool for several reasons, first one being it helps identify who is in the lead, and second being it just looks cool with how the environment and building change according to the rival's color tags. Unlike Hot Pursuit however, you don't have to clear every single event in each country to unlock the next ones. By utilizing a star rating mechanic, so you just need a specific number of stars to progress. But yeah, that is pretty much the career loop. Which you'll be doing three times in total as the career is split into three different difficulties of bronze, silver, and gold. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, the cars. I won't really sugarcoat it, the cars are ugly in this game with the wacky proportions. Like the rears of the cars are lifted up so much it makes them look like drag cars, and the big rooftop cuts. There's around 30 cars in total with some unique choices like the Volkswagen Camper and the Nissan Cube. The star ratings are also used to unlock more cars, but you're gonna have to 
to buy them afterwards, so better make sure to keep winning. And there's not much when it comes to the body customization. Only one option per part, so one hood, side skirts, it also featured a livery editor. This game actually utilized the freeform editor here and god bless it actually looks alright. Other than that we also got the tags which is mainly gonna be used for the own it mechanic I mentioned prior. With the cartoony vibe you'd probably think this game doesn't have any cops but they actually exist here as well. But it's mainly Hummer units everywhere you go and they can be a little bit annoying at times with their attacks of course. At the end of this playthrough I honestly felt like the only thing dragging this game down was the drifting challenges. You would have to get a certain amount of points while also battling against the time but you barely get points while doing drifts. It almost reminded me of Unbound Drift Trials where you would slide every chance you got to get some points. Other than that, this game was really fun to play. It had better pace than Hot Pursuit with some interesting directions for the cars, but ultimately a very gorgeous looking art style overall. So honestly, I don't get why it's hated by a lot of people. Yeah, sure, the cars are pretty unappealing, but overall the game is pretty solid. In fact, compared to the other two games I've played for this project, Nitro is the one that feels like it has the most polish overall. Like the only reason this this game is not considered the best for me is simply due to how batshit insane the run was with its goofy ass story. So that should be it. I'm not doing undercover because it's just the same as the PS2 port which I have already covered in the past. You can check it out if you're interested in what I thought of that port. But overall out of the three games I think both the run and Nitro are pretty good for different reasons of course. The run specifically because of its story being a complete janky mess. Easily the most memorable story in the Need for Speed franchise for not exactly exactly good reasons. <laughs> and Nitro for being a very solid racer with some unique mechanics and art style. Hot Pursuit on the other hand, while it is somewhat a solid racer on its own, it has a whole lot of issues from the bad pacing and the very repetitive tracks. Now I know what you might be thinking, this is called the downfall of modern Need for Speed games and I'm talking about this game in particular. This is not where I think it started but I'm just covering all the games Criterion and Ghost made in this decade. So with Hot Pursuit, there's two versions of this game, the original 2010 release and the 2020 remaster edition. For the sake of this video, I played on the remastered version, but I will add bits and pieces that existed in the original game. It was around this time Criterion was still working with the Burnout games and they wanted to try a new challenge. So they asked EA if they could try making a Need for Speed title, and to their surprise, the project was approved and they began working on Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2010. While Black Box at the time had their hands busy with with Need for Speed The Run. The last Hop Shoot game that we had was all the way at the start for Black Box Studios with Hop Shoot 2. This was made on Criterion's Chameleon engine and in 2010 they fully released this game. As the name mentioned you have both a racer and a cop career in this game. With the racer side you have 5 tiers of cars that you gradually unlock as you do the races such as normal events, time trials and hot pursuit events. While on the cop side you also have 5 tiers of cars with its own set of events. You had rapid responses, interceptor missions and hot pursuit as well. The game is set in Seacrest County which is a diverse open world with lots of coastline, desert sections, forests and even mountain areas. The gameplay is fairly simple to understand, you race, you win and you progress. The way to obtain cars in here is set around your bounty. The higher it is, the more cars you will unlock throughout the game. And in total, there are about 20 levels for each side and by the time you're close to finishing this game, you will most likely have all of them unlocked. Some have ridiculous bounty requirements, like in order to get this 370Z, which is in the first series, you need to have 1 million bounty to unlock it. And to get to level 20, you need 2 million bodies, so that's 10 levels just for one car in the first series. The car list from the 2010 release and the 2020 release have slight changes due to licensing issues. Cars such as the SLR, Sterling Moss, Carbon E7 didn't make an appearance in the remaster, but it did merge all of the DLC content from the consoles into the PC version. Cars such as the Lamborghinis, Porsches and etc. In the previous titles you were only able to use equipment on the cop side but now you can do it from both sides. Racers have their own set of weapons such as EMP, jammers, spikes and turbos while the cops have similar equipment with heli spikes and roadblocks added as well. You start from level 1 for each weapon but the more you use it over time it will gradually upgrade to the max level. The handling in this game is a little bit weird to get used to at first. The developers assumed you probably played the previous burnout games so you would be familiar with break to drift 
brake mechanics. But if you haven't, you will probably be using the handbrake a lot on every corner until you get adjusted to it. Let's talk a bit about the differences between both versions. Quite frankly, there isn't much to it even though it's called a remastered version. You will mainly notice slight graphical changes and in some cases, the 2010 version exceeds over the remastered version and the car list and the events being changed up as well. One thing that the remastered version did however is revive the online mod which also has crossplay into it, meaning you can play against Xbox players, PlayStation users and even Nintendo Switch players. But there is some downside to this, mainly traffic cars popping in out of nowhere. The PlayStation version is desync from the PC traffic so occasionally you will see things like this. What the fuck? <laughs> that shit scared me! <laughs> Fucking traffic cars scared the shit out of me, man. <laughs> it's only an issue with PlayStation users, not Xbox and Switch players. You have five game modes to choose from, that being Hot Pursuit, Normal Races, Interceptors, which are just 1v1 events, Most Wanted where you chase after one primary target while the other racers defend them, and Arms Races, which are normal events with weapons enabled. It is really fun to play with a group of friends, challenging each other and trying to win and some people still to this day enjoy the online modes that this game offers. However, there are some significant flaws such as cheaters. How do you have an RGB card? How the fuck is that possible, man? <laughs> this game doesn't have an anti-cheat system, so you can enable all kinds of speed up cheats, unlimited ammo cheats, and won't get banned or anything like that, which ruins the experience for a lot of players that just want to have some fun. Despite all of these things, the original version back in 2010 was able to garner more positive praise than Need for Speed The Run, and ultimately Criterion would move on to make the future Need for Speed games, and they instantly got working on the next entry into the franchise. Now this game is where the downfall part slowly starts to become a thing. In 2012 we were introduced to Need for Speed Most Wanted and when you hear the name Most Wanted 2012 you would assume that it would be some kind of sequel to the original Most Wanted. Similar gameplay maybe, Blacklist returning, but what we ultimately got was this. <laughs> what? <laughs> where is he going man? <laughs> Oh, he's going... <laughs> I, I want to follow him a little bit. Where is he going to take us? He's really determined to go this path. <laughs> Wait, can he push three? He's pushing three cars! He killed his tires! <laughs> what the fuck? I wasn't even alive for two seconds, man, and I, and I get killed. Come on, man, how light is my car? <laughs> oh, God, this thing. What? How, how, how did I die there? What happened? Where, where are you? <laughs> that counted as well. <laughs> Instead of all that, we got this in the end result, which if you look at all the beta footage on YouTube, is disappointing. To see such potential not fully worked on and get scrapped left a lot of the fans with sour tastes. Let's get this out of the way, I do think this game is good, but not as a Need for Speed game. It's like the Shift series, they are called Need for Speed, but they feel like Project Cars before Project Cars became a thing. It doesn't belong in this lineup. This game is fun as a burnout game, which by the way there is a mod that changes the loading screen to burnout, which seems more appropriate. One big issue with this game is that there is just no progression in this entire game. Let's take the original Most Wanted for example. You lose your M3 and then you have to buy the slowest shitbox possible to work your way up again and along the way you unlock better and quicker cars than before. There's nothing of that in here. You start the game in an Aston Martin, 5 minutes later you just jump into a Porsche. Then you jump into any supercar you find around the streets. I was playing this live on stream and it didn't take me even half an hour to get the fastest car in this game. There should have been some restrictions that would make you start from slower cars and gradually work your way up, but with this approach there isn't any excitement when you get a new car. Like you worked hard to get here and the game rewards you by unlocking faster cars. Also what it lacks is the customization options. You can only switch performance parts in here which you unlock by doing events in the game or if you have the DLCs for this game you unlock these parts for free. Did I mention this game has DLCs by any chance? The Maserati Stradal and the 2012 Carrera S are also available in multiplayer. 
You can now access the SL65s. <laughs> the Cater Ham. <laughs> the Ford F-150 was also a thing. <laughs> Terminal Velocity, Movie Legends. You can now access the Slim Jim Dodge Charger. All Grand Turn sports cars, muscle race, SUV, exotic, and everyday cars. This game itself costs less than all of these DLCs combined. I had to use a DLC unlocker because I'm not wasting my money on this. <laughs> you get a new area unlock, which is the airport, if you got the DLC. And let me ask you this. Does this actually look like an airport to you? Just, just genuine question. <laughs> this feels more like a space station you would see in a sci-fi film. But nevertheless, you get access to it where you can obtain a DLC car. You can even get the M3 from the original game by doing just a simple one minute event. Oh yeah, this game has a most wanted list. A list of drivers with the fastest cars out there and yeah, that's it. <laughs> they have no name, no face, no nothing. So for this part, we will just call them generic users and you have 10 of these generic users to defeat to be crowned the most wanted generic user in Fairhaven. These challenge events are littered with rubber bands. You pull a small gap on the AI? Nah, nah, I'm gonna pull up my rocket engine and come back in a flash. Oh my god, he literally just slingshot it, man. Oh, come on. That is pure bullshit. <laughs> like, it's so obvious. <laughs> just boom. <laughs> While doing these events, you also get chased by the cops, which outside of these events are completely useless. You could get busted on the streets, but nothing happens. You don't lose your SP, you don't get a strike or anything like that. You just get teleported to some location. What is the point of having cops in the game when there's no fear of outrunning them or getting busted? They just simply exist in this game, not serving any real contributions to the game and their AI. Oh boy. If you're dead or alive, it doesn't matter. They're gonna bust you one way or another. Even, even at the cost of their own life. <laughs> this can also be seen similarly with the racer AI. I'll give it that. Wait, what? <laughs> he fucked up! <laughs> that driver's a paid actor, man. <laughs> what a shot! Wait, is he gonna recover? Oh, he recovered already. Your car is made of feathers, resulting in you seeing crash cams a lot of the times. The only real positive I can give to this game is its online aspect. It was actually fun to play with viewers like Hopshoot Remaster. You can make your own list of 5 events that you'll be competing in, normal races, some challenges if you fancy that, and etc. But other than that, there isn't much else to ride home with this game. And in the end, Criterion was scrapped as the main developers for Need for Speed, and that role was given to Ghost Games, which we will talk about with the next game, Need for Speed Rivals. Up next is Need for Speed Rivals. This will be the first game from Ghost Games in collaboration with Criterion. Now going into this game, I have never played it before and what I usually got told from people is that it's very similar to Hopsuit and knowing that game was fun, I was expecting the same result here with better graphics, but boy was I wrong. Great stuff. <laughs> Escape the cop. And I'm already dead. Damage critical, but I couldn't even avoid him, dude. What do you mean? Good lucky business. So the main issue with this game is that physics are tied to your frame rate, so if you want the best and least buggiest experience, you need to play in 30 FPS. You can unlock it to 60, but the physics will tend to break a lot afterwards. The next big downside to this game is that it's always online. <laughs> Seeing a lot of cops chasing after one user and some of them starting a chase with me. When you do races, other people in your lobby can literally smash into you, even if they're not in it, and just in general cause a huge clusterfuck everywhere. Most of these events are similar to Hop Suit, so you won't notice a huge difference. The car selection in here is far less than Hop Suit, giving up to 20 cars for racer and cop careers. What didn't make sense to me was that some of these cars were only available in one side. Like the Porsche Carrera is only available on the cop side, 
but not on the racer side. There are numerous vehicles that have this, which I can't understand why when in hot pursuit most vehicles were usable on both sides. And also the cars are so easy to get totaled. Let's take a look at this. Your day so fine that boom. Random cop. To progress in this game, you select a speed list which consists of challenges to complete in order to unlock the next chapter. But this ends up mostly feeling like a chore. Like hitting a guy in the ass 5 times and bam, you've completed your objective, collect your reward. The most boring one was a mission where it just required you to drive for 10 kilometers. These are just so fucking boring, man. It's like, f how do you call it, fetch missions in games. Go here, pick this up, come back. Excitement. Like, was there no other way to implement this shit? Just make it more fun or something? That alone shows the lack of interesting things you could be doing in this game. And honestly, I didn't stick around with this game for long because I just felt so bored playing this. The cop side was a little bit fun because I wasn't dying every 10 seconds. But even that, after a while, I just couldn't make myself continue with it. When I'm doing projects like this, I want to try and experience as much as I can so I can give a fair judgment on them. But with this game, it was a true struggle to make myself play it. If you guys know some things that I missed in this segment, do correct me in the comments and give me your feedback on what you thought about it. I'd like to hear more about it. And this is where we move on to the infamous game that everybody loves in the Need for Speed series. Now let's talk about Need for Speed 2015. Wait, hold on a second. Sorry lads, that's it for 2015. This game is hated by most Need for Speed fans, but what are the reasons for that? Going into this game, I had no prior knowledge about it, so it was a first time experience for me. And I think I can summarize the game in one sentence. This was the most boring and lifeless Need for Speed I've ever played in my life. Before this, I always just heard people talking shit about it, but not knowing why, so let me mention my reasons why I think it's the worst Need for Speed. That guy's a paid actor. From the start, you are given a few star cars to choose from, but it doesn't matter much what you pick since most cars handle pretty much the same. A front wheel drive car like the Civic is going to act like a rear wheel drive car. Cops are invincible in this game. No matter what you do, they can't die, so the only way to lose them is by outrunning them, which in this game is piss easy. It's like they gave the cops the brains of a toddler. They lose you in nanoseconds, so just like in Most Wanted, you have to babysit them so you don't lose them. Dude, I'm not even trying too much and the cop is barely doing anything to me. Is the, is the cop dead? Wait, where the fuck are you at, sir? Get your slow ass over here, man. I have a fucking mission to do. Stop sleeping on the fucking job, man. I'm the one who has to do this for two minutes, man. There is no new gameplay introduced here apart from drift trains and toge. On the topic of that, the drifting in this game. I recommend using a drift build even for drift events because drifting on drift builds is essentially like drifting on ice. It's unenjoyable and it makes you want to break half of your stuff in your room. The physics are terrible. The car feels very heavy because of the input delay while steering normally. You usually have to kick the car using the handbrake and it's still not a certain way to make the steering reliable. The crash cams are annoying as before and you see them quite often, quite similar to most wanted 2012's crash cams. The events are simple but they are still boring to do and after a bit of playtime, they will get stale. As you saw in the start of the segment, the servers are terrible. The beauty of online only video games. This didn't happen just once by the way, it happened three times. I only ended up playing this for 2 hours before I lost my will to continue, so the rest of this part was written by one of my viewers who actually enjoyed the CBT that this game offered. Now, the story of the game is decent, it revolves around you, the unknown racer trying to help your 5 friends, impress the icons of the racing world like Ken Block, Nakai-san and etc. It's a story of a few friends having fun while trying to beat the best. The graphics in this game are probably the best the Need for Speed series has to offer. The car focus in this game is very strong considering how the performance and visual upgrades look like. And also there's a Supra in this game, Rip Bozo Unbound. <laughs> you can see the Need for Speed devs try to give fans a nostalgia trip into the golden age of Black Box and their series of games confirming this theory is the Eddie Challenge, 15 events with the 15 one being a showdown between you and Eddie and some other racers fighting for the crown of Ventura Bay. What helps support the nostalgia even further is the introduction of some of the older pieces of Need for Speed soundtrack. For example, Hard Drivers by Extract makes a return in this challenge mode. 
On the other hand, the prestige mode makes me want to rip my balls off. Prestige mode is a time trial like mode in which you can compete in older races from the career mode to try to set the best time. The prestige mode is almost impossible because you have to be perfect while the game stacks the cards against you. The stack deck is composed of online only mode causing you to miss checkpoints resulting in ruined time, spawning of AI traffic racers in front of you, making you suffer a crash cam and unpredictable handling to name a few. Overall, the game is a great love letter to car culture, sadly the game has many flaws which deterred a lot of players from playing this game for longer than an hour, including myself. Okay, so after 2015, surely it can't get worse than that, right? So Need for Speed Payback was the next entry into the series, which got released in 2017. It vastly looks different compared to 2015, and it also introduces three new protagonists, which we will talk about a bit later. You are set in the desert of Fortune Valley with your crew who are about to get ready for a job, which is to hijack a high-value car, but along the way, you learn your team got betrayed and everyone vanishes. Six months later, your character is hungry for revenge and tries to take out on Navarro alone, but ultimately that backfires quite literally. You get back in touch with your old crew and form a plan on how to take down Navarro. The main event in this game is called the Outlaws Rush, which you need an invitation for to participate, and to do so you need to take down rival crews around Fortune Valley. Tyler is more focused on normal street races and drag events, while Mac is more the adventurous type going for drift and dirt leagues, while Jess sticks to undercover work. Now about the protagonists, as I said before, there are three of them, Tyler, Mac and Jess. Mac is the fun type, always cracking a joke, messing around, Jess as well well, but sometimes she can get serious and then there's Tyler. probably the worst character in this series, and the main reasons are his personality. He's way too stubborn, too cocky, gloating about how he's the best, and just never jokes around, making him such a boring person to hang around with and wishing you would be doing something else with the other characters. Another thing most people hated about this, as I showed at the start, is the upgrading system. All the parts are now put into these poker looking cards and you have to spin a literal slot machine to get better parts. Great decision, EA! And also microtransactions are a thing for some reason. So you want 250 at speed, give us 2.5 euros, 5 euros, 10, 20, 40, 50! <laughs> I think I busted a nut looking at these prices man, holy. So in this game you can spend your hard earned money for these speed points that mostly just give you vanity items like neons, NAS colors, stuff like that, which is completely worthless to go for. Just like the whole idea of adding microtransactions in this game. But EA is EA, and they never change whatsoever. The map is very big, but in most cases, it feels rather empty to drive around. Similar to 2015, you will only notice a few cars at a time while driving around. You don't even notice the cops in the world. They're mostly designed to appear in the main missions and side stuff, but when it comes to free roam, they are non-existent. Some might like this, some might not, but it's hard to ignore this fact. The handling has been changed a bit, but it's still mostly the same break to drift handling we've had before, which depends on you if you like it or not. There are handling mods out there like arcade or sim handling if you don't prefer the vanilla one, but in my experience it didn't feel that bad to drive around. When you're going really fast, you will mostly just be using the handbrake to manage around the corners, but for drifting events it was alright. And then we have the crash physics in this game. If that's not their best shot, then I am scared to know what it is. <laughs> Overall, I think this game is okay-ish, it's a slight improvement over 2015, but it feels like a lot of unnecessary choices were made by corporate greed, such as the upgrade system and the microtransactions in this game. However, it did have a good foundation for the next game we are about to talk, which is Need for Speed Heat. The last Need for Speed at the time of recording this video is Need for Speed Heat. It used a lot of similar things that we saw in Payback and improved it in here. For starters, the upgrade system went back to a traditional way and not a slot machine style, and microtransactions weren't a thing. 
Although you could spend your money on the DLC or key to the map, which we will talk about later. Now what do you do in this game? You are thrown into a race as a dude called Joe, who is racing hard but also getting chased by a lot of cops. Joe manages to win the event but the cops weren't about to give up the chase and pursued him until eventually he crashed out and lost the car. This is where we are introduced to the antagonists in the game. Shaw and Mercer who are very corrupt cops that take street racing cars and sell them for profit. Joe gets scared and leaves town and Anna is left on her own. Six months later is where you arrive to a garage owned by Lucas. When you pick your avatar, Lucas sells you a starter car and introduces you to the Speed Hunters Showdown. During the day you can participate in the showdown events to earn money and customize your vehicles while during the night it's more dangerous because of the cops. You earn rep which gives you higher levels and unlocks more cars and customization parts. The cops at the start can be tough and if you underestimate them you will get busted. The story is good, all the characters live up to the roles, especially the antagonists making it interesting to play through. Most people enjoy what the game had to offer compared to the recent games and it was expected that it would get more content updates and DLCs introduced but after only 6 months of support EA disbanded Ghost Games and the only DLC that this game ever got was a $5 McLaren F1. Afterwards, the game was left stranded without much to do. Thankfully, modders such as the Unite team kept working on this game and over the past few years, Need for Speed Heat has gotten a lot more updates with newer cars, handling improvements, and etc. Speaking of handling, in the base game it used the Break to Drift model that we had from previous titles with slight improvements but also downsides. Especially with drifting, it felt harder to get your car into a drift and hold it there for long periods of time. It felt like a downgrade compared to Payback's drifting over overall. Also a fun fact, if you want to get better at drift, try using the drag tires. Surprisingly, they are a lot better than the actual drift tires this game gives you. The cops have also been changed, making them a lot more aggressive than previous titles, but the performance doesn't scale as you gradually get a faster car. In the late game you can outrun them quite easily. The damage system is a bit wonky. You lose a lot more health if you're hitting them so it's best to just try and outrun them but if you can't hit them and there aren't any pursuit breakers how are you supposed to take them out? Quite simple, just drive on stun jumps and they will immediately crash. As for customization, they give you a lot of options to play around with. Most of the parts could be changed with something else, even the way the car sounds could be played around which is pretty cool. This game had an online mode but it wasn't like previous titles. Here you could just make lobbies and race with your friends but trying to join one is painful to say the least. Me and my friends had to reset countless times just so someone else could join in. But they couldn't connect because the lobbies would be full relatively quick. Overall it was definitely a step in the right direction moving forward. It's been 3 years since the last release of any Need for Speed game and the fans have been waiting eagerly at this one. From all of the leaked shots, the gameplay trailers we were shown, it looks like a promising title but did it live up to the hype? Was it better than Need for Speed Heat or was it another failure? Today I'll give you my deep down analysis about this game and whether it's worth buying so stick around. Full disclaimer this video will contain spoilers regarding the game and its story and with that out of the way let's dive into the depths of Need Need for Speed Unbound. So right off the bat you are given the option to customize your character however you want. I went for this model cause it looked the same as the Gigachat face. Lots of clothing brands to choose from including the palace clothing. Once you are done making your Gigachat it's time to choose a star car and why are they so good? A Countach, an S14 and a Dodge Charger all can be chosen as Stadikas. Whatever you pick will impact the story a bit. Afterwards you and your friend Jasmine spend time restoring the selected car and accomplish your goal and take it for a test drive. Here you are shown the break the drift maneuvers, the handling overall and what you can be expecting from this game but I'll go into the handling talk a little bit later. You meet Rydell whose garage will be the main hangout for the crew and you are told on how you can participate in races throughout the meetups. There are several underground meetups all over Lakeshore and you can drive up to them to participate. There are other rivals with their own unique descriptions and after doing some events with Jasmine she tells you of a high value car you need to pick up which is a Nissan 400Z but once you drive it back she ultimately backstabs you. Where have I seen that before? Two years go by and Rydell is depressed and you get a call from a 
random woman called Tess to drive her back to the garage. Here's where she offers you a deal. She gives you money for a star car, in exchange you race and she makes money off of you. You will meet Jasmine as she will be driving an upgraded version of the starter car. And she also mentions the big event called the Grand. So we have 4 weeks of both day and night events to do leading up all the way to the Grand where you can try and get your ride back. It's like in Most Wanted where Razor sabotages your ride and steals it and you work your way up to get it back but in this game you get to choose what car you'll be racing for which I think is a pretty cool detail giving more meaning to this starter cars and more reasons to try and get it back. You have a lot more starter cars to choose from. I went with the Eclipse since we haven't seen that car in such a long time and now it is up to you to do the most with each given day. We have two money icons on the top right, the green one is the money you got right now and the red one is the cash you have earned but need to bank in otherwise if you get busted you lose all of it. There are no levels anymore like there were in Heat, now you just simply play through the story and unlock more vehicles in certain race days. What I like in here with the calendar system is the way day and night and heat accumulation systems help create situations where it is beneficial to do planning before leaving the garage, making things more strategic than what it would seem. The races have their own risk and reward factors, some races might give a little bit of heat while others will fill up the bar by half and your heat will carry over into the night so if you're at heat level 5 in the day, expect to see the steroid injected Ford Raptors in the night. Seriously, these things are not fucking around. What the f- WHAT TO- DUDE, DUDE, WHAT TO- one issue I think most had here is that you earn barely any cash at the start so you are very limited on what you can do with your money. Do you spend a day's worth of cash on upgrades or making your car look a bit more interesting or just save the cash to buy a better car later on? Would have been great if the rewards were a bit higher early on to give you a bit more freedom to play around with but at least in the later weeks the rewards are much higher. While playing this game I was a bit surprised to see different elements from other games introduced in here. Like for example in the events you can bet against other racers, an element that we have seen before in games such as Juiced 1 and 2 and during the races you have a second nitro that builds up from different actions you do in the race and when filled up a bit it will give you a boost similar to how the boost is in the Midnight Club series and also characters being able to trash talk you in the races depending on if you're racing really good or being an absolute dumbass. Speaking of the events, what I like is that each of the characters that you race against have more life in to them. You can read about each person's background, how old they are, where they're from. Nice to see these characters more fleshed out. That was a thing missing in Heat. Apart from characters in the story, no one else really stood out. Let's talk a bit about the cars and customization options. Like in Heat, you have a lot of options to play around with. You can select pre-made kits or select the parts individually. Although some of these kits are definitely out there in terms of looks. Some of these things we have seen in Forza Horizon like the emotes tab, custom horns, and etc. Beep beep. The car list is mostly the same as the previous titles with some older cars returning in here like the Eclipse, Honda Civic, RX-8 and newer cars like the Mercedes 190e, S14, 400ZX and lots more. The cars are classified into classes namely B, A, A+, S and S+. Depending on how fast the car is, cars can move classes with the help of the performance customizations in the game. There are a lot less performance parts compared to Heat and they vary from Sport, Pro, Super and Elite. But to unlock higher end upgrades you have to upgrade your garage as you progress through the game. The garage upgrades don't cost too much so you can unlock these parts relatively quickly. There aren't a lot of different race event types, it's just circuits, sprints and drift events and the takeover events which is the same as the speed cross events from Need for Speed Payback. It can get tiring to do them after a while, what would have been nice is to have a bit more variety in the events, like for example the outrun events from Underground 2, maybe speed trap or knockout events from most wanted just to change it up a little bit and in some of these events the AI have such a big advantage over you that it's almost impossible to win. R look at Rocky, look at him. 500 meters already man. I am pushing this thing to its limits. 600 man! I didn't even bet against them dude. Yet he's so fast still. 700, 800, 900! He's just going, man. 
Main car Rocky is the fastest thing in this game. The cops in here feel a bit more fun and interesting to evade. They are more aggressive, but in the early stages, it's fairly simple to avoid them. And even if they start chasing you, 9 out of 10 times, they will crash themselves out on some random car or whatever is behind you. In Heat 4 and 5, it becomes a bit more intense, but still manageable. They've changed the way you can take and give damage to others. In Heat, if you tried attacking the cops, you would just be losing a lot of health. But in Unbound now, you don't take any damage when being the aggressive which is a really good change, letting you have more fun with the cop chases. You can also fix your car if it's critically damaged the same way in heat, but now once you fix it, you have to wait a couple minutes for another chance to get a repair, instead of the two or three per night you would have in heat. One annoying thing that occurs a lot is when you're escaping them and a new cop spawns right in front of you restarting the chase, or the amount of cops the game spawns around your area, barely giving you any chances to escape. One thing that needs to be mentioned is the cell shaded art style and effects in this game. It has stirred up a lot of mixed opinions from the community. In my opinion, I think they are cool and something new that we haven't seen before in prior Need for Speed games, giving a bit more life into the environment. I do understand that everyone's a fan of this, but just seeing them trying something new instead of the same stuff over and over is a nice touch, but do let me know your opinions on them. As for the environment, it looks beautiful in this game. The way the colors are for both day and night, the vegetation, the light trails coming from your car while driving at high speeds, the countryside all just felt so nice to look at. Looking at heat and unbound side by side, you can notice such a big difference in the quality of both worlds. Let's mention the handling a little bit. It is very similar to heat's handling, but a lot more tuned and refined than before. You can also play around with the sliders and get it the way you want it to be. Full grip builds, full drift builds, whatever you like. In the star, it's pretty good, but it can be tricky with the S or S plus cars you get later on, especially with the sudden grip boost with the second nitro. But the drift handling doesn't feel truly satisfying. You can tell it was carried over from heat because it's hard to keep a drift going or to initiate one. I think they should have kept the drifting as it was from Payback, but nowadays it's a lot slower and more tedious to drift overall. Multiplayer doesn't have a whole lot to do right now and parties are limited to 4 members only, which really sucks but hopefully will fix in the near future. Currently, if you have a full lobby and you're in a session, you have to remove someone from your party, they will still be in the server and then invite another friend and hope the server isn't full for them to join, leading to such a janky way of playing with your friends. And the events you do are simple playlists that the game already has. What would have been nice is you being able to make your own playlist. Like in most one of 2012, you could choose up to 5 random events, it could be races, challenges, whatever. You pick those, name the playlist however you want. And and just play with your friends. That's the main thing I liked in that game and it definitely would help in Unbound's case making the multiplayer much more entertaining or even better the speed lists from Payback that most people enjoyed would be a good addition here. There's also no cops in multiplayer but they did mention might make an appearance later on including the betting system. One area I feel like the game is a bit meh in is the narration and voice acting. The male voice actor lacks any emotion whatsoever. It's like he's stoned 24 7 whenever he's talking. I haven't tried the female protagonist but most have told me that she sounds a lot better than the male protagonist. As for the soundtrack, I listened to it a bit. I think there are a few decent songs in here and fit the theme but then you have songs like Money which makes your ears bleed instantly. It's not the best, I do agree with that part. but. But it is miles better than Heat soundtrack and I did listen to that as well. Here's the result of that experiment. Overall, would I recommend this? Absolutely. Despite some flaws the game has, it's a really decent experience, but a lot of new fresh ideas implemented, fun gameplay, world to explore. You're guaranteed to have a good time with this game. And that wraps up this very long video. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it though, whether it be the full video or specific parts that interest you. Thank you for tuning in and watching any bit of this video. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.